what I want to emphasize, oh yes, sorry, uh, got it, there we go. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. And given this gauge gravity geometrization tradition, um, something that is only been, so this has been, you know, past uh, almost a hundred years. And what is interesting, is, and this is, this is true only in the past 10 to 20 years, maybe even just 10, is that there's a new exciting error for what mathematical physics is now, is, is, is today, this interaction between fundamental physics and pure mathematics, is that in the, there's a new player to the game, and that's been made possible in the, in the last uh, decade or two. And it's that uh, computational aspects of geometry and group theory and combinatorics and number theory have become a crucial ingredient to fundamental physics. I know these words like SAGE, Macaulay 2, GAP, you know, LMFDB, GRDB, which are, I think at this point, have become very much embedded in the mainstream mathematics community, has actually, in the last decade or so, become part of the standard language for theoretical physics. And I've been a very much of an advocate this, of, of, of this aspect uh, to the theoretical physics community. So just a very brief uh, one um, slide summary of what string theory is and why it is interesting to this community. Um, and then I won't say any more about string theory. It's just that, you know, string theory is this candidate for um, unified theory of quantum gravity. I mean, that's, it's sort of, sort of the holy grail for, for fundamental physics, because once you have these two, you understand sort of the last theory of, of everything. So this, of course, is a program that's been going on since 1950s, um, you know, since Einstein even. But, uh, and it, it's, the computation has been very, very difficult because when you try to quantize gravity, you run into technical hurdles. And string theory still today remains, and this is something that came out of um, the 1970s, and the string theory um, is still to this day remains the best candidate that unifies the theory of, uh, theory of gravity, this general relativity, with the theory of quantum field theory, which, um, so the quantum field theory describes the standard model of physics and uh, of, the, of the microscopic world, and general relativity describes the evolution of galaxies and the cosmos on the, on the macroscopic scale, and unifying this to still the best candidate today is this theory called string theory. And that's all we need to know. The only problem is that this theory is consistent. Uh, the, the standard solution to the consistent of the theory is that it exists in 10 dimensions. And we don't live in 10 dimensions. We live in three plus one dimension. So we've got to somehow have to argue away the hidden six dimensions of, of, of space. So one of the standard paradigms that I'm going to talk about, or you can make them very, very large. I won't talk about that, but I'm going to talk about one of the ways just to say, well, you can make them very, very, very small. So small that they're at the Planck scale. So we are, um, we, don't, we simply haven't, haven't observed them, right? So this, the Planck scale, just to give you an idea, is 90 orders of magnitude smaller than what CERN, the be our best uh, detector for small distances, can detect. 19 orders of magnitude. So that's that's quite small. So fine. So that's why we haven't seen it, but it doesn't us, it doesn't prevent us from doing mathematics with it. So we as a community, the string community and the string math community have been studying um, the ways of uh, you know a compact what we call compactifying these extra six dimensions. And the problem is that you know one of the stand well no problem what 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 the a, a very specific approach towards addressing this six extra dimension dimensions is to consider them as um, complex three dimensional algebraic varieties. So that's that's a realization in 1984. I'm going to get to that to that in a minute, a little little more detail. So there is this complexification that's needed, and in fact, not just that, but scalarness, which is needed, which essentially comes from the requirement of, of supersymmetry because string theory is an inherently supersymmetric theory. So that this physical constraint makes one of the standard solutions a three complex, in fact, scalar um, uh, 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 variety. And, and that's where the mathematics comes in. So, and here is the biggest problem. Uh, we don't have a selection criteria. We, we don't know which one of 
th complex three-dimensional Taylor varieties we should choose in order to, to get something that's even remotely akin to our universe. And of course, as, as is probably known to this community, this is a, you know, a, a, a mathematics community, and it's that there are a lot of complex algebraic varieties, right? This is, it, it, grows, it grows exponentially with dimension. I'm gonna show you an example uh, in, in a minute. And th these are, so that's a challenge to physicists. You know, we can't, you know, if there are only, you know, uh, five or 10 complex uh, Taylor varieties, uh, say, say compact and smooth, then we can just check them one by one. You know, check one, does it give, a, give particle physics or, or, or a gravity, gravity the way that we see it? If, if, if it doesn't, throw it out, try another one. But unfortunately, estimates of this kind of geometries, uh, not just the underlying manifold, but in you know other uh, structures like fiber bundles on them, et cetera, et cetera, or counting the number of algebraic cycles on them, estimates like 10 to the 500 already seeped into the public imagination as far back as 2003. And more recent estimates say uh, that we're, we're really talking about at least something 10 to the 10 to the 5 of possible ways to reduce 10 dimensions down to four to produce universes. Okay, so that, that, that's a huge number, right? So this is called the vacuum degeneracy problem and it, it is the biggest theoretical challenge to, to where we are today. Because we don't have a selection, we can't just rule out um, you know, the swarm of them. And we don't even have a, so a more technical way to say it, we don't have a metric on the landscape or concept of distance, which one is closer to others or which one's closer to our universe. Of course, you know, 10 to the 10 to the 5, it could be that 99.9999% of that doesn't give a universe even remotely close to us. You know, it could give like 15 generations of electrons, but we just don't have a way to, to check that a priori. And we just, uh, our current technology, well, so far in the last 10 years, has been just doing case by case checks. And just to give you an appreciation, independent of all of the physics I've been talking about, the underlying reason for this kind of huge numbers is that algebraic geometry very, very often leads to combinatorics. And that once you're into combi in, in the world of combinatorics, you are in the world of exponential growth. So let me just give you an example. So our favorite um, Kähler manifold is of course the Ricci flat ones. So th this was the realization that the, um, the physicists realized in 1986, that the one of the standard solution is a Ricci flat Kähler manifold. Of course, the mathematics community has been considering Ricci flat Taylor manifolds really technically since the time of Euler and Gauss, right? If you think about the Euler classification of surfaces, of orientable, smooth, compact, boundaryless surfaces, you know, we, 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 we know from Euler that just there's this genus that controls this, right? And, you know, when you realize that these, uh, you know, I guess, you know, what, what Riemann's realized, what Riemann realized that these, real surfaces are complexifiable. You know, smooth, orientable, compact surfaces are actually just complex dimension one objects, right? So in this sense, there is this really beautiful trichotomy, right? So there's the spherical geometry, there's Ricci flat geometry, and then hyperbolic geometry you know, of positive zero and minus curve and, and, and negative curvature. In algebraic geometry, we can generally consider this kind of positive geometries to be funnel varieties, and this kind of zero curvature objects to be Clavier varieties, and things like this to be general time. So if for surfaces, Kähler-ness is, is automatically guaranteed because Kähler, Kähler requires the closeness of a two form. So for, for surfaces, that's trivial. The point is, is, you know, there's this beautiful story that relates to topology, to algebraic geometry, to differential geometry, um, and to, to index theory that, you know, expands across various disciplines of mathematics. And if, for, to, for example, you know, this, this relation, right? The, 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 the integral of the curvature divided by two pi is exactly the Euler number, is what Gauss considered his greatest theorem. So this is quite impressive stuff. So of course you can phrase this kind of uh, integral in modern algebraic language as sort of intersection theory between uh, cohomological classes and homological classes. And to, to generalize this theory beyond complex dimension one, as you can imagine, is very, very difficult. But at least in the, in the Kähler world, this is more or less still, you can state it in, in, in this form. And that was the, the, the content 
of Calabi, Calabi's conjecture from the 1950s. So given a complex, a compact halo manifold, essentially I won't bore you with the details of the theorem, is that the, this churn class does indeed control curvature the way that for surfaces, Gaussian curvature is controlled by the first churn class. But this was a, this was a conjecture. Calabi proved the uniqueness, but he couldn't prove the, the existence of such, such Ricci flat scalar metric. So Yao did it um, uh, 30 years later, for which he was immediately awarded the Fields Medal. And that's why you, know, you can see this is an important problem uh, in the tradition of, of, of geometry. And it just so happens in, in 1986, when these physicists stumbled upon this con condition from, from string theory, uh, they needed this Ricci flat scalarness condition. Um, Strominger, one of the authors, was actually visiting Yao at the Institute of Advanced Studies. So Yao said, well, well actually, I, I know a couple of things about this. Since I just got a field model for it. So then it was actually the physicists, physicists who actually called compact Taylor Ritchie flat manifold Kalabi Yao in honor of the Kalabi conjecture and Yao's subsequent resolution of this conjecture. So this is an interesting fact that the word Kalabi Yao actually was came from physicists. So let me just give you a very, um, so that's algebraic geometry and differential geometry. How do, how, so how does this go into, go into combinatorics? Well, the most impressive list of Klavier uh, manifolds is actually due to a theorem of Boris of Bakira. The theorem says that if you take the toric variety constructed from a so-called reflexive polyhedron, then the the anti-canonical hypersurface in that toric variety is guaranteed to be Klavi Yau. Okay, so that's a technical definition. Again, I won't bore you with that definition. What is important is to recognize the following. So what is a reflexive polyhedron? A re reflexive polyhedron is just a lattice polyhedron, so convex body in dimension n, such that you know all of the vertices are lattice points, and such that all of the bounding faces are the co-dimension one objects are distance one from a single interior point, and there's a single interior point. Okay, so for in in dimension two, these are called reflexive polygons. Okay, so you can see you can see all of these polygons have this property, right? All of the points are lattice, and there's a single interior lattice point, and all of the boundaries are distance one from this interior point. And this was known in the 1890s by the Italian school of, of geometry. And the point is that we know in every dimension that the finite number of these things up to SL and Z. So in dimension two, up to SL two Z, there are exactly 16 of this, but the next number is already unknown. So if you take a hypersurface in the toric variety constructed out of this, you're gonna get, well, two, so the toric variety out of these things is gonna be a two dimension, gonna be a two complex dimensional final variety. And you take a hypersurface in that, you're gonna get a clavia one fold, and that's an elliptic curve. So an elliptic curve or torus, the, the algebraic model of, an, of, of, a, of, a, of a torus are these special things here. But the next dimension is already unknown until the work of the physicists, Kreutzer and Schacher, who in 1999, a hundred years later, just brute forced this and counted it on a Pentium machine. And, and they, they counted up to SL3Z, it's 4,139. So these will give you two complex dimensional um, Taylor Ricci flat algebraic varieties, which are known as K3 surfaces. Now, I told you that we wanted complex dimension three, right? So you need to construct four dimensional polytopes. And Kreutzer Schalker, in a year later, enumerated this up to SL 4Z. This is an incredible number of almost half of a billion um, such, such you know, polytopes in four dimensions. And if you, if you take the hypersurface, you're going to get Clavia. And a dimension greater than four is open. There is, you can see the combinatorics grows exponentially. And we just don't know. They, we don't have a generating function for this. This is, this is one of the simplest open problems that I know. You can explain this problem to a high school student, and yet it's an open problem since, since 1890. We have no idea what the next number in this sequence is. And I encourage everybody to study this. And somehow, this knowing the next number is very, very useful, both to geometry and to fundamental physics. So we did some estimates of what it might be, but of course these are just extrapolations. So this is the fundamental reason why there is such a plethora of possible vacua 
in in string theory just simply because algebraic geometry leads to problems in combinatorics in such a time. And um, I won't I won't bore you with uh, you know with uh, with yeah just just to assure you that we are we're not um, um, searching uh, random spaces. You you can in, in fact find something that leads it into the to our universe from such a list. So the point is, just to, uh, to summarize, um, each geometry, for example, scale the standard solution is, which is like Kähler geometry or Kähler geometry, gives some kind of four-dimensional universe. It may, not, may or may not be related to any universe that we, we observe, but uh, the geometry does determine the physics, right? So there, there's a nice, a translation that's been done by both the physics and the mathematics community in the past um, decades, a couple of decades, in translation between the geometry and the physics. For example, particle and interactions should be thought of a cohomology, cohomology theory on X or bundle cohomology theory on X, et cetera, et cetera. For me, and for me, you know, I, the most exciting thing about string theory is that it answers, in some sense, this old saying of Kepler, uh, where there is matter there is geometry. So in this sense, string theory is really the ultimate geometrization program in terms of understanding what nature actually is. Um, something I like to compare to, so this is what I, hence the first part of my title, um, namely uh, universes as big data, right? Think about this plethora of geometries, you know, billions upon billions upon billions because of the combinatorics, and each will likely give a universe, and each, and you know, in principle, you can think about selecting among these universe universes. Is it, is it probabilistic? Maybe it's anthropic. Maybe our universe is what it is. We select a particular geometry because we're here to observe it. Two, there's another way you can be, maybe there's a selection rule that, that really drills down on why our universe is the way that it is. And for me, you know, I kind of like two because it's very pretty and it gives you the assurance that our universe and we in it are special. But of course, that's just personal feel. Or three, you can take a completely quantum mechanical point of view, and you can say we are in, in one of multi possible multiverses, and we're just in, in quantum parallel. We just happen to have landed in this very special universe, which has two, you know, has one pair of Higgs pair, or, you know, particles. It has three generations of fundamental quarks, and so on and so forth, which determine a certain class of geometry. And again, as I said, to to rest assured, we are. Um, uh, Preliminary searches in the last 10 years have shown that we're not searching uh, an empty set. We do produce occasionally about one in a billion or so, a universe that is something akin to our universe. So that's, so rest assured, this program is not in vain. You know, if, if you sample through trillions and you don't find anything like our universe, you're not, well, you know, depending on taste, it could be a good or bad thing, right? Because we, we, we're talking about many, many. But on the other hand, if on the, the probabilistically we hit something like one in a billion of something that's at least on the rough ballpark of our, our particle content, then at least we know where to start from that point, or from where to go from there. So as I said, um, because we're talking about hugely exponential growth of, 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 of numbers, it is impossible to do a case by case computation. Of course, you know, I see where some of this community will say, well, why don't you just type in some of these geometries? You can, they're very explicit. You can write them as, uh, as algebraic functions, feed that into MathSage, hit return, compute cohomology, and see how many you know, particles, how many electrons you get. Yes, you can do that in principle. Well, one, scanning through 10 to the 10 to the 5 is not going to finish in time. It'll take the age of the universe to do it. And even so, we know, obviously, the the key computational uh, bottleneck to uh, computational algebraic geometry is the group of the basis. And unlike its linear counterpart, Gaussian elimination, which is polynomial running, the group of the basis is a double exponential complexity problem. So you, you know, you got, you got 10 to the 10 to the something number of possible geometries. And each geometry is a double exponential running complexity problem. So you're not gonna be able to just search through the, you know, through the entire search space. I mean, we know what to do in principle. So for example, a, a typical calculation is as follows. I give you an algebraic variety. So here, I don't, I don't, I'm not even gonna, let's not even worry about what this means, right? But okay, if you really wanna know, I'm gonna whisper to you. So this is 
a, uh, a complete intersection defined by multi-degree polynomials of given this multi-degree embedded in say p1 cross p1 cross p1 cross p2 so on so you, this is an object this is a projective variety a multi-graded projective variety which trust me is actually a compact smooth clavier variety so then what we know we know say for example i want to compute h21 of this sucker to be 22 right so i mean for example this 22 in physics can show up as a number of uh, uh, anti-generations of, of fermions right but the computation, we know what to do because, you know, Bouvaki tells us what to do. Bouvaki tells us to, you know, to change long interact sequences until you're blue in the face. You know, luckily, thanks to people like, like Mike uh, Stillman and Hao Shang and, and, and Dan Grayson, and, 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 you know, these are implemented in Macaulay too. So for very, very simple varieties, you can just put all of this in there and hit return. And it'll give you a number. So, okay, let's stop H21 and so on and so forth. Um, which is which is nice, but as I said, you're not going to be able to do this in for 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 large uh, you know for, for more complicated varieties like this. So this got me thinking in like in 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 2017. Well, I don't I have no idea why I was thinking about this problem in this way. Maybe it's because of like a huge number of my postdocs and and, and graduate students at that time left for industry, and the moment they're suckered into industry with a PhD in math or physics, you know, they make you do data science. So I learned. Um, machine learning from them, and they were telling me about this is like really cool stuff. So I look at this picture and started thinking, well, why can't I just represent this as a pixelated image? Right. So instead of running through Bubaki, what got me thinking is that is it possible to start training? So, so this image, I mean, but this is partially a joke because I can represent this, you know, say if I, if I put one as green and, and zero as purple and two as uh, red or whatnot. Every uh, one of these representations is a particular image. And, and I want to iterate that. Um, in fact, any algebraic geometry problem can be thought of at some level as an image processing problem, uh, given sufficient large amounts of proper computation. So, so Bubaki tells us what to do. You can implement that on Sage and Macaulay too. Say once you've gathered a hundred thousand cases, you have some confidence of that it's doing something. Then it's just it's just a simple uh, image processing problem, right? It's, it's an association rule that this image should be associated with the number twenty-two. Right? And then the natural way to do it is to well just machine learn this problem without any regard of whether your your machine learning algorithm understands anything of the background geometry. Right? So in other words, you do the standard machine learning thing. You take uh, you know, just um, I just want to emphasize this right. You know, in machine learning usually gets you know some 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 pixelated images like this from NIST, which poor graduate students have been entering for for at least since the 1960s, and then you feed in some some neural neural network. You do some training of of this, and then you do some uh, then you then you validate on on ANSI data. Now, of course, you are asking me at this point which neural network. Well, let's try some generic one. Simply because I just don't know any better. I don't know of a neural network that does algebraic geometry. But let's just try a couple of couple of them, see how how well it does, right? Um, in 2017, I had you know epsilon knowledge of um, machine learning. And now I have uh, epsilon divided by two amount of knowledge of machine learning. But at least it's a bit a bit bigger. Um, I think that's that's the correction. Yeah, that's the correct direction. Just want to make sure that's the correct direction. And um, and at some level, uh, you have universal approximation theorems at work, right? So, you know, in physics, what we do all day, well, actually, what, what most of physics is, is linearization. We can't solve some unlinear, we can't solve nonlinear PDEs, we can't solve nonlinear ODEs, um, we can't do nonlinear anything, so we approximate, we linearize. So much of what we understand as, as fundamental physics, you know, such as Feynman diagrams is just done by Taylor series, essentially a very complicated Taylor series with some chosen parameter. What, what the neural network approach gives us um, is something a little bit better. Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have conditions of smoothness so to, to, in order to give this Taylor expansion. We, but we have something that protects us at universal approximation theorems, which, you know, given sufficiently large depth or width, um, you can essentially, I won't get into the details of what it is. Uh, essentially, approximate any kind of input and output. 
right? That that's that's the magic of machine learning, and then it becomes a black box. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk my, myself out of the black box in a minute. But for now, let's at least back in 2017. That's what I was thinking. Let's just treat it as a, as a as a black box and choose some kind of neural network that could could be that could try to compute something like this. So I was very surprised that it worked. So um, I took about eight thousand matrices of this type. I I, I had in my um, in, in on my laptop because I've been doing computations like this with many many friends and collaborators over years. I had I had this database and this database is a very small one compared to the Kreutzer Scarka one, which is half billion, which you know we're working on now. This is the complete intersection database, and it's nice. It has nice matrix representation, and it's you know you can think of what well, Klabianus is not even necessary here, right? And you can think about most varieties of being being well, right? You can think of most. Well, certainly you can think of any Kähler variety as being represented in such a way. You can always find some kind of projective space in multi-degree multi in which you can do this embedding, and then it becomes some, this image process problem. And people have been computing the, the exact numbers from traditional methods, and it, it could be quite expensive, but it's been done. But then you take 8,000 of these, you shuffle up them up uh, after permutation, you can easily generate something on, on, on the order for you know, 10 to the 5 number database. You train, say, 50% of them, uh, just as, as as this association rule, and see how well you do, right? I was expecting like I don't know, completely random. Right? Well, why would why would any simple? So I used um, a forward feed three layer neural network with um, linear activation, maybe hyperbolic tangent activation. None of that piece of nothing in that piece of information knows anything about algebraic geometry, and yet. Very quickly, was able to get into the 90s in terms of precision in predicting this number. This number has been, over the years, been improved by, by many, many authors. For example, these beautiful papers of Urban and Finatello have improved it to 99.96% accuracy. Of course, you know, you say, okay, fine, what's, what's wrong with the 0 0.08? I don't know. This is in progress. So if you want to read more about this, you can, you can, you can read my book. I try to summarize a lot of this progress of this. Um, of course, this book is physically motivated, but I've since gone more and more like just trying to think of what it is. I'm um, okay. This is a, a shameless self advertisement. I want you to buy this book so I can I can get royalties. So, well, don't buy it. Get get every single library in the world to buy it. Then then I collect royalties and I'm happy. So, in in some sense, um, I, I actually interestingly, like a couple of friends at the time who are thinking along similar lines in string theory community of applying machine learning techniques. So somehow it was in there. I wasn't talking to them at the time. So they're they're so 20, 2017 is when it's sort of a string theory enters this machine learning era. Very coincidentally, the same year that Sophia becomes a human citizen in Saudi Arabia. So it's uh, you know it's it's up in the air. But this really got me thinking, which is um, I'm just checking my time. Sorry, I'm gonna uh, Fundamentally, what got me thinking is like, you know, why should we stop at geometry? You know, why stop? Certainly, why stop at string theory? You know, why, why stop in geometry at all? What what problems in mathematics can be addressed in in this way, at least on an experimental basis? And then I will try to address some of the more serious um, in, interpretive ideas on, on on this. Right. So this got me thinking. If you excuse me for a few minutes of a few moments of speculation, right? I think there are really two ways that one does mathematics. The first way is you got to go back to the to the fundamentals, right? If you think about Russell and Whitehead, you know, Principia, you know, formalism from mathematics line by line, right? When that program was killed by Gerd and Turing in the 1930s because they proved that they're unprovable statements within any order of logic in, in mathematics. But this never deterred, you know, practicing mathematicians to ever worry about Gödel, right? Because, you know, we don't, you know, I, I'm sure as, Algebraic geometers or as mathematical physicists, we don't sit around and think, oh my God, am I ever going to hit a problem that's going to be too incomplete? I mean, occasionally we do, but that doesn't stop us from continuing to come computing here. So, so in 1956, as far back as 56, you know, actually, as right about the same time as the first neural network, uh, the idea of a neural network completely, uh, you know, independently, that um, this people started thinking about this automated theorem proving paradigm. You know, so in the beginning, we just to prove axioms within Russell and White. And of course, this has been hugely uh, improved by the Lean project 
and especially by people like Kevin Buzzard and Harold Davenport. And I think Kevin just gave the ICM address on this on this point, so I won't belabor it. So I, I know very little about this. But what I like to call this kind of mathematics could be bottom up in mathematics. And it's you know, just sort of formalize the mathematics line by line until you prove all of the statements. And fine, you, you can certainly get a lot of mileage in, uh, in, uh, in this way. And this, that's what Buzzard's uh, Zener project is all about. And people very, very optimistic, like Shigerty in Google DeepMind, extrapolates, you know, this kind of stuff has beaten humans at chess by 1990s, go in 2018. So it should start producing new theorems by 2030. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what this extrapolation mm -hmm. is based on, but hey, if Google says it, it's gotta be right. Um, so, <clears throat> Let's see. So let me just, so that's one way to do mathematics. Well, there is another way that we do mathematics. And this is what I call the top down approach to mathematics. By the way, bottom up and top down are, are words that physicists use a lot. So I'm just borrowing this word. And, and this idea is to gain intuition experience by, by experimentation, not, not building up mathematics line by line, but to just look at some intuitive idea and then try to formalize that idea and then try to prove something. And, you know, to be honest, this is how we mostly do mathematics during our day, right? We, we play around, we muck around a little bit and we see some patterns and then we formulate some conjecture and we prove it. And then when we submit it to a paper, we write it backwards as if we never did the experiment as, you know, if it's God given. Somehow, I think that's also a product of Bubaki to write and do mathematics in our style. But we shouldn't forget experimentation. So if you think about, you know, I always say, you know, what is the best neural network of the 18th, 19th century? Well, it's obviously the brain of Gauss, right? That neural, work, neural network is unparalleled. Gauss can look at this and say, well, this is clearly x over log x before the age of 16, right? And then we, we should remember, right? He, he saw this and then he said, you know, the, the prime counting formula is x over log x before complex analysis was invented, 50 years before complex analysis was mature enough to allow the, the actual formal proof. It was just purely based on pattern recognition. And even more, you know, more recently, we, we, do, you know, we forget that Birch, Swin, and Dyer, that conjecture was raised because Birch, Swin, and Dyer ran some, in the basement of, of in Cambridge, some, they plotted large numbers of ranks and uh, rational points and conductors on, on elliptic curves until they, they spot a pattern. And that remains one of the most profound open conjectures in my life. So this top-down approach is essentially what I was doing at some level with algebraic geometry, right? So this is a different type of data. You know, normally when we do, when we talk about machine learning, we talk about noise, noise data, like NHS this, or, or NIST data, handwriting, because there's so much um, vari variation. But this data is mathematical data. We have now terabytes of such data online. GAP has 10 million finite groups. Um, LMFDB has 3.5 million elliptic curves. Um, GRDB has something like uh, half billion polytopes. And so you know, all of this is now becoming readily available to us online for free. And, and I highly encourage young students, if you can't sleep at night, just go to these websites and download them. It, it fits on your phone and then just keep on staring at them until you see something or better yet, write a Python script that starts to recognize patterns. So in some sense, this top down, what, what is top down mathematics is to look at say a hundred thousand of these, whatever, whatever it is, or labeled cases of hundred thousand cases of this, whatever your computation is. And then one, see, is there a pattern? And two, and this is something I, I think is also very, very interesting, which got me kind of obsessed over the years. Can I actually tell which branch of mathematics it comes from by looking at 100,000 cases of social matrices? And, and that's not entirely a joke. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that uh, shortly. And so since, since 1997, with my, my very um, talented team of students, we've been looking, and postdocs, we've been looking at just mapping different problems as much as possible from different branches of mathematics. And I'm going to give you two case studies before I before end. and and many many friends um, i'm very excited to have gotten yao involved in this uh, he's very much involved in interested in, in this and i think to this to this community i think you particularly know al kasperger 
who is a good friend of mine, and we've been doing machine learning in the polytopes. And I think Al has done has been thinking about machine learning in polytopes uh, for quite some time with uh, with the Imperial crowd. So let's do. Uh, let's. I'm just going to run you through with just two example cases. Let's let's look at the first one. Right. Let's let's go to a problem in in group theory or representation theory. Um, here is something. This is done jointly with Minyoung Kim, who's a who's a, a very uh, high-powered uh, number theorist. Let's look at um, well, forget about this one. Uh, let, let's let's just talk about the second problem. Can I look at the Cayley table of a finite group and then recognize it to be a finite simple group? Now you know that this is not a simple problem, right? Because normally I have to look at the multiplication table of the group, every every you know, which is a pseudocoup. Uh, it's 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 necessarily a pseudo but not not sufficiently so. You, you need extra conditions on a pseudo you in order to see a Cayley table. But then you look at this Cayley table, and normally what you do is you compute the character table from this Cayley table, or use some fancy Silov theorem, and then decide whether your group is simple or not. The character table does do it, but then computing the Cayley table to the character table is a non-trivial computation. So what we did is we, we took you know the first I can't remember first couple of hundred book groups. Get the Cayley table, shove them all up, pack them with zero if necessary. That's an n squared vector. And then just plot this in, in, in the dimension of, of n squared. Okay. You would expect that finite simple groups and non simple groups will be completely randomly distributed in this space. And yet, what is surprising is that a support vector machine to 97% accuracy and 95% uh, confidence, so that this is chi squared to a 20% training. So we train on 20% and then we validate on the remaining 80%. You can do, that's that's pretty damn, damn good to tell that this, there's a separation hyperplane, sorry, hypersurface, which tells you what a simple group is. There's, no, to my knowledge, there's no theorem at all of any type of this type, or, or any of a theorem of such a type in representation theory, which, it's a very strange way to do group theory, right? You just plot it and somehow, uh, as, uh, you know, you leave it to you know, that this is a really nice geometric representation of what a finite group is, right? You know, every finite group is a point in this in this high dimensional space and a support vector machine can actually kind of find the, the kind of pull apart the ones which, which are simple. Why? I have no idea. So this is a proto conjecture. Um, it's not a, quite a conjecture because I, I mean I can tell you the equation of the hyperplane even, but I need to understand why this is the case. But at least this is a nice way that purely by by data science we're able to raise this proto conjecture in in representation theory. So that's case study number one. So that's that came from representation theory. Case study number two. Let's take a problem in combinatorics. So here there is, so by the way, so this was done because as I said, um, the GAP database has uh, 10, the first 10 million uh, finite simple groups, except the powers of two. It, it even has the sporadic ones because the power of two is just too many. Like a group of 10, of order 1024 is over like several million itself. And then what about, let's do something common parts, right? Let's try something like, uh, here, uh, Wolfram has very kindly provided us with a, a simple graph database, right? Now you can do some graph properties, right? Can you look at the adjacency matrix of a graph, shuffle it up if necessary, so permutation is always good, to you count the data because it's equivalence of the permutation. Um, you can decide problems and we just put these numbers. Um, or everything blue is, the, the first number is naive accuracy, the second number is chi-squared, and uh, this is all of this is at 20% training and 80% validation. So you, here you just put it in binary matrices and binary matrices is throwing them. You say, so is it is a cyclic or not? That's a binary decision problem. Um, does there exist Hamilton cycles or the cycles? And it's, you know, boom. And you can get this kind of level, uh, this level of accuracy is fairly quickly. You can see it's not as good as combinatorics. Uh, and not as good as, uh, sorry, it's not as good as algebraic geometry and not as good as, um, you know, uh, representation theory, but it, it, it is what it is. Um, let me just check my time. Okay, good. Um, fine. So, some from, well, what is interesting, at least from, I'm just reporting from an experimental, um, 
experience is that you know if you're trying to muck about with the standard algorithms, whether you're using a you know convolutional network or or a, um, a support vector machine or or your favorite thing or your or Bayesian classifier, or do whatever, um, they don't actually make that much of a difference with this kind of generic classification problem. Um, it's only when you really and put I mean, of course, that's biasing your, 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 your machine learning algorithm. If you start putting in your knowledge of what the actual underlying mathematics is, then you can okay, get, get much better accuracy. But if you just want to throw in some random, you know, your generic, you know, out of the box uh, machine learning algorithm, then they, they all tend to do around about the same. And this is, it is what it is because, you know, you don't expect, um, you know, randomly, some you, you're going to hit on a good, or, or uh, you, you're going to hit on a machine learning algorithm that stands out. That, that's the basic, basic idea. So now you know where I'm getting getting at this. Where algebra geometry good, um, and representation theory pretty good. Uh, combinatorics okay. One of the problems about combinatorics is that it's very, very difficult to, to machine learn graph isomorphisms. So permutations of matrices is something actually extremely difficult to learn. Uh, so you have to build permutation symmetries into your neural network. But of course, again, that's that's cheating a bit if you, if, if you see what I mean. Okay, that's okay. It's not it's not crazy. You know, 80 percent accuracy is not bad. Right? And you see where I'm getting with this. Of course, the moment you, you, you enter arithmetic, then maybe it's not so good. Um, because you know, if I can if I can machine learn how to factorize a prime, or, or even machine learn how to even recognize a prime, you know, I'll, I'll be rich and famous, right? Because I can start cracking banks. Uh, but sadly, uh, I haven't been I've been trying with whatever fine-tuned neural network to try to factorize large integers, and it doesn't quite work very well. Uh, I just want to emphasize. Um, this problem in analytic number theory is called so-called Sarnak challenge. And this problem is, can you do, can you recognize the Liouville lambda function? So what, so what this function is essentially, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm adjusting a little bit. Um, the Liouville lambda function just counts um, the parity up to multiplicity of the number of prime factors given the integer. Okay, so if you are, so four has two squared, so four is two squared, that's two um, prime factors. So the Liouville lambda here, I can set it to be one. And then if it has an odd one, I set it to minus one. It's a little more involved than that. There's a, there's a, there's a case of zero, but let's not worry about it. Let's just think about parity. And then Peter Sarnak, who was a leading um, analytic number theory, says that it's very, very hard to try to predict what the Liouville lambda is. But well, let's yeah, try machine learning this problem, right? So I, I let, let me take a hundred, uh, a sliding window of length a hundred, and so it, it you know it's just been basically one zero zero one zero one zero this length a hundred vector, and I just want to predict what the next one is. What is one or zero? So this is a binary classification problem of a binary vector. If this problem, if this problem came from algebraic geometry, you know, if such a similar problem came out from, or even from from representation theory, I can bet you money it will learn within above 90% accuracy in a matter of seconds. This one, I really couldn't find any neural network that could do break even basically. So this, this, these numbers mean breaking even, right? So uh, the, the validation accuracy is 50%, you can't do better than a coin toss and your chi-squared is, is actually zero. If you can, do, if you can just do 0.51%, the Sarnak will be happy to give you some money. Because then you found some pattern that the analytic number theorists don't know about, and then of course you've got to interpret it. You know, you know, don't use some random black box. You need to understand why the neural network is so bad. But I couldn't find any machine learning algorithm that breaks uh, fifty percent. It is what it is. Um, so factorization, factorization of primes, classical um, arithmetic problems, not so good. Surprisingly, arithmetic geometry. Fantastic. So if you look at, so and I won't bore you with, you know, uh, things like um, Descent uh, these ones, you know, the, I was working with card carrying uh, computational number theorists. Um, you, can, you can really predict uh, whether, um, 
um, certain lift curves or certain number fields have properties uh, like you know order or, you know, the type of Galois group for example to very very high accuracy very quickly. Something I want to emphasize for example if you really look at the Birchmore and Dye conjecture, um, you can so so here. Uh, what's interesting, let me just flash very quickly, there is a strong version of the Birchmore Wooten diet. So the weak version of BSD is that the order of vanishing of the alpha function is dictated by the rank of elliptic curve. But the strong version says that it's not just dictated by the rank, but it's actually given by, by exactly these products. Right? And if you want to just predict using the L function coefficients of an elliptic curve to predict to predict its rank, its its regulator, and all this you know, fancy stuff, it does to um, this level of accuracy. However, if you want to do something like Kate Schaffer H group, which I'm not an expert in by any means, this is where I know epsilon cubed amount of expertise. Uh, but people, but these guys tell me that the Kate Schaffer H group is the hardest part of the strong BSD conjecture. And this one we could not get, this is interestingly the worst um, performance in this kind of prediction. So to summarize, um, this kind of approach, this top-down approach into to mathematics is obviously very useful to mathematics and physics. Right? It's good for conjecture formulation. So as I already mentioned to, uh, to you with Kim, we, we conjectured the existence of this, hype, not this separating hyper, sorry, this is a typo, hypersurface. It's, it's nonlinear. Uh, it's a bit, it's curved um, between simple, uh, simple and non-simple groups. And we have to yet to understand why this is true. And um, our, our, some of my friends and colleagues have uh, gotten an exact formula for, for cohomology in surfaces, for, for line bundles of cohomology of surfaces. What they were able to do was to just have enough of them computed. And then they um, um, started plotting in moduli space of the, of the bundle, which you can represent as a, you know, for, for line bundles of surfaces, you can, you can uh, often represent these as a two dimensional grid. And then they just see uh, where uh, there's a jump in, 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 the, in the rank of cohomology group. And then they found all the boundaries and then you can actually analytically prove them. So that's kind of nice. So this, the machine learning there was really guiding towards what, what, what you should be uh, looking for in terms of, ba of boundary results. And as I said here with uh, Lee and Oliver, we were looking at prediction um, of say torsion points or, or ramps of linear curve from, from, from L functions. And that's of course, um, unfortunately that's already been proven. That says that we, we were doing this blindly on a neural network, but this is part, um, you know, sort of very profound conjectures like Goldfield cast and Sonic conjectures, which was sort of the neural networks kind of reproduced without any knowledge of, of such, such profound effect, uh, some, uh, some results. And conjecture of uh, Goldfield cats and then more recent results of uh, Gava, who have proven that, you know, 50% of, uh, of the curves um, are in rank zero and rank one and so forth. Um, and then so on and so forth. And the other uh, Jones polynomial fits uh, done by these guys. And then more recently, uh, just last month, there's been a paper by the DeepMind collaboration, which uh, again, you, you take what they did was very nice. They took knots and they did exactly the same similar kind of game. You, 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 they took, um, took Jones polynomials uh, which is uh, deeply related to the volume conjecture. So there's some uh, properties of this algorithmic function for, for, the, for the Jones polynomial that dictates the volume. And they were essentially using uh, some neural, net neural network to find bounds, which then they can analytically, analytically prove. So this approach from top-down mathematics, I think is very, very fruitful. And I think it, uh, we, we're now at the stage where we are going to be very much reliant on uh, machine learning techniques to help us raise new conjectures. Right? And it was not to mention that, you know, this is for free. You know, you can certainly speed up computation and, and improve accuracy. So for example, one of the things we tried with metrics, there's a famous Donaldson algorithm. So I, I forgot to mention, there's no known Ritchie flat analytic uh, Kähler metric on any Clavier manifolds above the trivial cases. So the Yaus proof is purely exist is existential. Nobody's ever constructed an analytic proof. Nevertheless, Donaldson gave a very efficient numerical algorithm which converges, and what he calls a, a, conver a convergent balance matrix, which converges towards the Ritchie flat Kähler metric uh, in the most efficient way possible. 
what we did was to take the Donaldson algorithm and then just train it on some patches, or say on the quintic, uh, quintic variety. And then because the Donaldson algorithm requires higher and higher sections, so you need an exponential growth of the monomial basis, uh, it's going to be very, it, at some point, it's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to choke up. So what we did was to take low-lying um, basis of sections and then seed it with a couple of them in the, in the high-lying ones and then just extrapolate it using a very simple feed, uh, forward feed neural network. And that was able to speed it up to about two orders of magnitude. Uh, the Donaldson algorithm for by two orders of magnitude. Uh, why is it doing that? I, I'm not giving an explanation. All I know is that when we check the accuracies, it is as good, if not better, than the Donaldson measure of um, of the of the balanced rigid flatness of the metric. All we all we know is that it, it is doing is doing that computation at two orders of magnitude faster. So this is clearly, you know, this kind of top-down approach to mathematics is obviously useful for uh, both speeding up anything you want to do and conjecture formulation in order to do some uh, to do serious uh, serious uh, analytic proof. And of course, now it gets to 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 wrap up a bit. Um, this also gets me thinking a bit. You know, it, we we saw in our examples, at least in the past five years, the kind of problems we've now had dozens of experiments uh, in various uh, branches. There seems to be this decrease in precision or increase in, in, uh, in difficulty of how well a generic machine learning algorithm learns mathematics. So the simplest is a numerical, I mean, as you would imagine, right? You know, because that's what neural networks is really born to do. And algebraic geometry is not bad. You know, you could get 99% accuracy fairly quickly. And then algebra is a bit harder, it seems. Combinatorics is a bit harder. Maybe the reason for that is because it's very difficult to learn permutations of matrices. And analytic number theory, really, as you would expect, Diophantine problems are really very, very hard to machine learn in, in any by any reasonable measure. Because um, well, once you do it, you can just, well, if I, if I did it, I won't be here. I'll just be cracking banks. You'll never see me again. I'll be like permanently on a beach somewhere. You'll never see me again. I'm not saying it's, in, it's, it's impossible, but I think that there is such an inherent hierarchy in mathematic, mathematical problems, which is kind of in tune with how we would expect it intuitively. So um, here's another uh, another advertisement. You can so, so this kind of experimental mathematics is not really suitable for experimental mathematics, right? So there is a journal of experimental mathematics, but experiment journal journal experimental mathematics only wants your submission when you have formulated a very clear conjecture of what needs to be proven, right? So how do you where do you go with with proto conjectures? And just some fun experimentation of, and, and speculation, or just simply, or um, with the nature of mathematical data. So as far as as far as I know, there is no such a such a journal. So if it, when there's a lack of a journal, you start one yourself. So here should be we should be launching in 2023, and forget about so don't don't worry about the editor in chief. Um, but we do have a very nice uh, board of uh, of um, um, editors. Um, interested in, in, in this so from, from all disciplines, from uh, algebra geometry to mathematical physics and number theory. So how Shank, for example, is, is on, 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 on board for this. And, um, and I think I'll just stop there and I have time for the questions. Thank you very much.